Have any of you ever gone on a trip of a lifetime? That trip that you always wanted to go on, it was so exciting. Maybe you've got that in mind that someday you want to take that particular trip. One that's just going to just wow you. You know, so many things that you want to see and, and do. Uh, well, you know that uh, a few of us had opportunity to go on one of those great trips this uh, last month. We went to England and then France at the Congress. It was great to, to go there, it was very exciting with all kinds of things that we got to see, all kinds of things that we wanted to see that we didn't get to see, but what we did get to do was, was great. Uh, every trip can be very, very exciting. And, uh, there's more types of trips than just going to another country or another part of the country. There are, there are, there are journeys. We call sometimes life a journey, don't we? The journey of life, and on the front of our, you know, even the, uh, the front of our bulletin, that, that graphic on there that says talks about what we are as a church, that we're on a journey together to know God, to discover, and to live out His plan for our lives. All kinds of journeys, and this week I want to start a new journey. A journey that's going to take us, I have no idea how long. It's a journey that's going to, to, to wind its way through a wonderful, wonderful story. There'll be times that we'll take breaks from it. There'll be times we'll take little detours. But we're going to take a journey through God's Word. And a journey through God's story with His people. We're going to look at some highlights. There are going to be things that maybe you've never seen before. There are going to be things that you are so very familiar with. We're not going to see everything. You may go along and say, I really wish we'd stop there, stop there on this journey, and we didn't. But I'm hoping that as we go through the fantastic journey of God's story with His people, that you'll join us and be excited by it. Now, where do you start a journey? <clears throat> it's too simple. You start it at the beginning, right? There's no other place to start every journey but than at the beginning. And where does God's story begin? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. One of the simplest and most profound verses in all of the scriptures that says simply, in the beginning, God created the heavens, and the earth. And that simple verse is packed with truth that we, I wouldn't even begin to touch all of it. But there are a few things this morning that I want us to look at to understand where this wonderful journey begins. So we're going to look there and we're going to pull it apart a little bit and hopefully get us a good running start on this fantastic journey to God's Word. In the beginning. It seems like such a simple phrase. But it is packed with deep and profound meaning. What does it even mean, in the beginning? The word beginning simply means that it is the first. There is nothing before it. It's where it all starts. When we think about the beginning, in, in terms of the creation of the world, we, people sometimes ask, well, what, what was before the beginning of the world? But you know, the reality is that the word before has no meaning when we're talking about the beginning. Because time, even time, didn't exist before the beginning. There was no time. If there's no time, there can be no before. You can't talk about what existed before the, the universe because there was nothing until the beginning. When we understand this, we start to realize that there is something beyond just our created universe. We enter into the realm of eternity. 
something that's not limited by time and by space, because both time and space exist outside, or they both exist inside our universe, and eternity exists outside of it. <coughs> Eternity is not about time going on and on forever and ever. Eternity is about what exists outside of time and space. That's a very profound idea and something that if we try to wrap our heads around, well, it can make your mind explode. Scientists and physicists battle with that question all the time about the beginning of the universe, what caused it, what was there, so to speak, before. But you know, science actually agrees with the Bible. People like to think there's a big conflict between science and, and, and faith and science and the Bible, but it's amazing how science agrees with it. Have you ever heard of the Big Bang? The Big Bang is not about some great big ball of all the matter that's in the world all lumped together and then suddenly exploding out into space. Not at all. The Big Bang is about the very creation of space and of time. Again, before, using that word, or until the Big Bang, there was no time. There was no space. When God speaks and says, let there be light, suddenly time and space exist. Science agrees with the Bible. They just don't necessarily know it. See, the universe has a beginning. <clears throat> if the universe has a beginning, does that mean it has an end? The Bible makes it very clear that it does. Scientists will tell you that it will be billions of years from now. Well, I suppose it's possible. But the Bible tells us differently, doesn't it? The Bible tells us that the universe that we know of, as we know it, will end when Jesus returns. Now, we have no idea when that will be. It could be next year. It could be 10 years from now. It could be 100 years. It could be 1,000 years. We don't know. But the universe has an end, just as it had a beginning. But the most important thing that we can learn and understand from the fact that the universe has a beginning, and it has a limit, is that this answers one of the great questions of all time that people ever ask. You ever heard people say, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. Well, this really answers that question. Yes, there is more than this. There is a whole realm far greater than anything that we can see. Far greater than anything that we can explore in this life. It's the realm of eternity, the dwelling place of God. Far greater than our creation. Yes, there is more than this. And our goal, our destiny, is to live in eternity with God. Beyond the limits of this life. And praise be to God for that. If this is all there is, it ain't, it ain't much. But God has so much more in store for us. In the beginning. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. This simple verse tells us that when the universe began, God already existed. He was already there. God didn't come into being when the universe was, came into beginning. Came, in, came into being. God exists in eternity. He's therefore not bound by, by the limitations of space and time, which are part of the physical universe. God's immensity can't be measured because God doesn't live in space. He doesn't live within the confines of space. He lives in the unlimited, limited, the unlimited, the limitless realm of eternity. In fact, he is that limited, limitless realm of eternity. Perhaps that's why God can be omniscient, which means all-seeing. Why he can be omnipresent, which means why he can be present anywhere. Perhaps, I'm not, 
I don't know if that's the explanation or not. But certainly, God is not limited by time and space. He can be anywhere. He can see everything. Because He's not limited the way you and I are. You know, the very name of God tells us so much about Him. Right off the bat, we learn about God and His profound nature when, when we read it and we come across this simple two-letter word in Hebrew, which is El. In the beginning, El. This, well, oh, actually, sorry, it's Elohim, excuse me. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The simple root, that's where El comes in, the simple root, El, which is frequently used as a name for God. You may have heard, if you've been around the, uh, the Bible long enough, terms like El Shaddai, you know, El Elyon, simple word used to, as a name for God. It's a word that, that, has, that carries the meaning of, of mighty and powerful, everlasting, enduring. It creates a picture for us of, of who God is. The mighty God, the almighty God that the Bible calls Him. Or the creator God, the God who creates all things. The God who makes all things because He is all powerful. He's the everlasting God, the God who has no beginning, the God who has no end. He's the God who makes the creation out, makes the universe out of nothing. Again, the eternal God. Psalm 90, verses 2 to 4. A wonderful description of this eternal God. It says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Doesn't matter. We think a thousand years is a long time, but to God, it's nothing. Because He is the everlasting one, and that's contained in that simple name, Elohim. But what's particularly interesting about the name Elohim is that it is plural. It is actually a plural word. Now why is that significant? Because the Bible is very, very clear. It was the most important belief of the Jews that there is only one God. There is one God and only one God and any pretender was an idol. And idols and idol worshippers were to be destroyed. But Elohim is plural. Right at the beginning, in the very first verse of the Bible, the triune and nature of God, the Trinity, the idea that we don't see really unfolded until the New Testament of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is embedded in the very beginning of the scriptures. One God, three persons. The concept that we probably have a great deal of difficulty understanding if we really try to nail it down. That there's one God, yet the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and they are all one and not three gods. New Testament, the Bible as a whole, the New Testament is unwavering in its teachings about Jesus. There are those, of course, who don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and there are those who say, well, the Bible doesn't really teach that. There are religious bodies that try to explain the way Jesus is being some lesser being, but the Bible is so clear that Jesus is the very same God described or mentioned in Genesis 1-1. Just jump ahead to John chapter 1, verse 1. And note the similarities in the wording there. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
that all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus, the Word of God, was with God, but he was also God, and he is the Creator. You can jump to the end in the book of Revelation. And we read in Revelation chapter eight, or chapter one, verse eight, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. But we go to the end of Revelation in chapter 22, and Jesus is speaking to John, and he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Just as the Father had said earlier, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the first and the last, the beginning. And the end. He not only was at the beginning, but he is the beginning. In the beginning, in the beginning, God. Oh, the story is all about God, isn't it? It began in him, he started it, he will end it. But in the beginning, God created. God created. You know, many scientists don't even bother with the question of, of what made some, this, this great big something happen. It, it, it's too much. They like to explain, they like to describe it. But how did it happen? That's a little bit much. Some of them simply say, well, you know, it's just the laws of physics at work. You know, I, I read this. Well, one scientist speaking at a, a conference saying, it says, speaking about the Big Bang, which is said to have brought the universe into existence 13.7 billion years ago, Alex Sopenko said, the Big Bang could have occurred as a result of just the laws of physics being there. With the laws of physics, you get universes. Researchers say that random, fluctuat random fluctuations can produce matter and energy out of nothing, and universes can be the result. Another scientist, senior astronomer Seth Shostak, said quantum mechanical fluctuations can produce the cosmos. It's as simple as that. In other words, he's saying it's an accident. It's an accident of the laws of physics. He goes on and says, if you would just, in this room, twist time and space the right way, you might create an entirely new universe. It's not clear you could get into that universe, but you would create it. That's very imaginative, isn't it? Shostak said, so it could be that this universe is merely the science fair project of a kid in another universe. That's, that's profound. In other words, I have no idea how it happened. It's just an accident. You know? Well, let me ask about these laws of physics. Do the laws of physics exist in eternity? Did they exist when there was no universe at all? Are the laws of physics eternal? Why is it that scientists have no problem with eternal laws of physics, but they have a problem with an eternal God? What are the laws of physics anyway? What are the laws of science? They're simply a description of the things that happen in the universe. They don't say why they happen. They don't say where they came from. But we know. Because in the beginning, God. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As it is written, Paul wrote to the Romans, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of God, the God in whom we believe, who gives life to the dead, and who calls into existence the things that do not exist. God makes them exist. Scientists will tell you, you know, you can sit and you can, if you got the right equipment, you can watch material stuff come into existence, and then go back out of existence. Pretty cool. And then one scientist I read says, see, it's just a natural process. You don't need God at all. It just happens. 
happens all the time. And I'd say, wow, it's pretty neat to be able to watch God at work, isn't it? Now, I'm not going to make any attempt to prove one way or another whether or not the universe is 13.7 billion years old or whether it's just a few thousand years old. Scientists almost unanimously will tell you that it's still the, the longer, but there are a lot of creationists who believe that it's, the world has only been around for a short time. There are Christians who are on both sides of that argument, and I'm not going to try and convince you one way or another, because I'll be honest, I don't know. I don't know. What do I believe? I don't know. I really don't. I struggle with that. I struggle with that. I know that the Bible doesn't try to be a science book. But I know that the Bible tells us the truth. And what the Bible tells us is true. So we can debate about when it comes into the story of creation, what is it trying to tell us? But we're not going to do that here. But I'm going to tell you that there are certain things in the story of creation that are really important that we understand. You see, there are, there are basically two different terms that are used in the story of creation to talk about God's creative work. And it's really important to understand the difference between these two terms because it gives, gives us a real understanding about the truth of creation. The first is a Hebrew word, I think it's pronounced Hayah. And we know it simply as, let there be. Let it exist. And it really is a, it, it, it is a very general word, but it's often used in, in conjunction with, with a, 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 pro, a creative process. And, and, and it could take a long time. It doesn't have to. It's a very, very general meaning word. But there is one word that's used three times in the first chapter of Genesis. And this word is key. The word is baka. And it means to bring forth something from nothing. To make something exist where something didn't exist before. And it's used about three things in the book of Genesis. In the beginning God created. God baka, the heavens and the earth. He brought forth into existence something that didn't exist before. We move down to chapter verse 21 and we get that God Baha, the great whales, or the great sea creatures, the beginning of real big life. And we get to verse 27 and we read that God Baha, man, in his image. When God created Adam and Eve, he created something where there had been nothing like it before. So if you want to believe in evolution, I don't know the process that God used and everything else, but let me tell you something. Without a shadow of a doubt, the Bible is very, very clear. You are special. You are a special creation of God. You are the handiwork of God. You are not an accident. You are not the result of some endless stream of genetic mutations and accidents. You are crafted by God and you are descended by a, from someone that God created very specially at a very given point in time. That much the Bible is very clear of. And he goes on and he gives us the details about Adam and Eve. How it all fits together. How science and, and, and the Bible all fit together in all the details, I don't know. But never let anyone tell you that the human race is an accident. Because the human race is a very special work of God. Created where there had nothing like it before. 
The universe is a special creation of God. Human beings are a special creation of God. And that tells us, as we go on this fantastic journey, it tells us that we're not an accident. And if we're not an accident, we're here with a purpose. God has a purpose for the universe. He has a purpose for the human race. He has a purpose for you. And as we go on this fantastic journey over the months, maybe even years to come, I don't know, we're going to be on a journey together to know God, to discover and live out His plan for our lives. Because He has a plan. That's why He made us. That's why in the beginning He started us on this fantastic journey. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for these simple and great truths. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that in this wondrous creation, you have made us as well. That we are the special, treasure, handiwork of God. And Lord, as we go on through this fantastic,